Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Beacon webinar series on rising sea levels. My name is Ivan Alonia. I'm the Heart of Was Research Fellow in Environmental Climate Change Law, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you back to the series and to today's webinar on climate change litigation before domestic courts. It is great to see so many participants here this evening, in addition, of course, to our excellent speakers. Thank you all for joining us and for your interest. Now, I have a few logistical things to mention, then I will hand over to Lord Canworth, who will be chairing today's session. Let me just start by thanking Landmark Chambers for supporting this webinar series, and to Beacle for convening, in particular, our events team, Bradley, Carmen, and Liam for registration for Zoom support. I would like also to remind everyone that the recording of the previous three sessions are already available on, on the Beaker website, and also that this one will be uploaded in the next few days. Finally, if you have any question for the speakers, please do use the Q&A function on your screen. We will have time at the end for uh, of all presentation to ask as many questions as we can to our speakers. And now it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Lord Canwart as today's chair. Lord Canwart is a former UK Supreme Court judge and now an associate member of Landmark Chambers. He's an honorary professor of law at University College London and an honorary visitor, visiting professor in practice at the Grantham Institute at the London School of Economics. Uh, he's an honorary president of the UK Environmental Law Association and he was a founding member of the EU Forum of Judges for the Environment and of the Global Judges Institute on the Environment. Welcome, Lord Canwet, you have the floor. Thank you, Ivano, and a pleasure to be asked to chair this session. And I'm looking forward very much to hearing the ranges of, of lectures, talks we've got. Um, this, as you know, is the fourth of a series which have been looking at aspects of rising sea levels, although I think this evening we'll be looking rather more at uh, domestic litigation and rather than necessarily the focus on the sea. We're lucky to have three um, highly qualified speakers who come from different angles. First, we have Deepa Sutherland, who is a senior associate in the London office of the, um, the uh, American New York based firm of Zella International LLP, international law, and with special interest in insurance and business practice. And she'll be looking at, in particular, the interest of the insurance industry in climate change and the state of climate change litigation in the US. Um, we then move to Joanna Setzer, who is an assistant professorial research fellow at Grantham Research Institute uh, at the LSE, where she leads the Climate Laws of the World project. In particular, she leads the um, database on climate litigation, which is one of the most comprehensive databases there is. Um, but she also has a Brazilian background and will, she'll be looking, I think, with particularly at a sort of more global South perspective or of climate litigation. And then lastly, we have Alex Goodman, who is a fellow member of Landmark Chambers, practicing in public planning and environmental law. Um, he's appeared in a number of cases on climate change, including representing uh, George Monbiot, the wind farmer Dale Vince, and the Good Law Project. And he's involved in a number of current challenges on issues relating to airport policy and so on. So uh, he'll be looking particularly at the UK domestic litigation scene. So I will um, not say very much unless I feel bound to intervene, which I might do. Um, as, as has been said, we're hoping that you'll put forward some questions because we have a bit of time at the end for questions with the sp speakers and um, we hope to involve in that way. Uh, uh, so I will start then by asking Deepa Sutherland to give her talk. They each have quarter of an hour and I shall be quite strict 
in making sure they stick to that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll try and share my screen and hope it works. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know why. It's... There we go. Okay, firstly, thank you so much for um, inviting uh, Zell to speak at this um, with such a distinguished panel. We hope you'll find what we're going to say useful and a, a nice insight into the insurance industry in general. Um, we're going to cover very broadly the insurance industry and climate change. Um, what's the connection? What risk and exposure does the insurance industry um, face? We're also going to look very, very broad overview at climate change litigation in the US, how it's developed and where it is at the moment. And then we're gonna consider where next for climate change litigation and also how will the industry respond? So who are we? A brief introduction to, to myself, Zeller coverage lawyers for insurers. Liability insurers have a duty to defend and indemnify their policyholders against claims made against them by third parties. Policyholders are being sued right now for causing climate change and they notify claims to their insurers. Those insurers instruct us to review the notifications and to opine on coverage and exposure. Essentially, is the claim covered? If it is, how much for? And are there any third parties that may be liable? Now, as a firm, we're currently instructed on a number of active climate change lawsuits in the US and elsewhere. And why are insurers concerned about climate change? Well, really, one, because climate change is real and it's happening now. And secondly, climate change litigation is real and it's happening now. We're not talking about a theoretical risk and climate change litigation is increasing. So just stepping back and seeing where insurance fits into all of this. Climate change is a business issue. There's an economic cost to it. The obvious examples are flood damage, wildfires, Everything is insured, people's homes, oil companies, professionals. And if climate change is a business issue, then it's an insurance issue. Just think of property damage claims, business interruption losses, liability claims. But the insurance industry faces a unique exposure. Firstly, as an investor with its own shareholder obligations. And then secondly, on the underwriting side in paying claims. But those two sides of the business aren't always tied up. And here we're focusing very much on the claims side. And the industry is vulnerable to catastrophes caused by climate change, which impacts across all business lines. But there's specific concerns about the liability exposure, really because of how far reaching it is, how significant it is, and how uncertain it is. What is certain is that at some point, trillions of dollars are going to be exchanged in connection with climate change, which poses a threat to the industry itself. And given the role of insurance in underpinning financial stability of the whole system, a threat to the wider economy. And these increased vulnerability risks also trickle down to issues like affordability of insurance and sovereign risk. So briefly, why is climate litigation in increasing? Well, really because of the perceived or actual lack of political will to do anything. Activists are using courts as a forum for change whether it's routine actions or strategic actions aimed to shape and change behavioral policy. In parallel with that, climate science is developing. Arguments are being tested in court. Plaintiffs are being creative and bringing claims on all sorts of bases to see what works and where. And we're focusing here on the carbon majors litigation in the US. And we're often asked why carbon majors in particular are the targets of lawsuits. The easy answer is they're the biggest emitters. Um, Furthermore, climate science has now quantified their respective share of global greenhouse gas emissions, which gives plaintiffs something to work with. Also, plaintiffs are looking for systemic change. What, what, what underpins the whole system, the society we live in? And of course, they have deep pockets. It also avoids some rather uncomfortable circular arguments of, of who is the end user and who actually is responsible for climate change. So how are insurers uh, affected? Well, behind most of these lawsuits, there's a liability insurer, or more specifically, a whole tower of insurers and reinsurers, each taking a slice of exposure at a different level. And really for them, each carbon major is actually a blue chip policyholder, which liability insurers have a duty to defend. 
And insurers are paying for this litigation. Whether or not a suit is ultimately successful, insurers will always lose because they are often paying the costs of defending these lawsuits. And a very broad, very broad overview of um, US climate change litigation. So first of all, we have to mention the Clean Air Act, which was the first federal act to deal with air pollution and authorize the development of federal and state regulations to limit emissions. And then we have a good example of two cases, Coma and Murphy, which concerned the Gulf Coast following Katrina, and Kivalina, which concerned um, an area in Alaska. And they both concern the issue of rising sea levels and anticipatory damages. Both of them were nuisance claims brought by municipalities against big oil and gas for damage and anticipated future damage caused. But both were dismissed at an early stage because of a lack of standing. That is, they couldn't demonstrate a link between the damage they alleged they suffered and the conduct of the defendants. And this is something that we've seen change in the new wave of, of climate litigation. It's also worth mentioning Massachusetts and the EPA, a Supreme Court ruling where, whereby greenhouse gases were deemed air pollutants under the Clean Air Act and could be regulated by the EPA. And also the case of AES and Steadfast, which is the only case about insur indemnity insurers duty to defend a policyholder um, accused of causing climate change. And this went to knowledge, what the defendant knew or should have known, and whether that was an occurrence under the policy. Now, the liability policy would not cover damages arising from a separate climate change lawsuit, as the policy only covered an occurrence, which must be an unexpected event. The other lawsuit alleged that the insured knew the probable consequences of emitted greenhouse gas emissions. So in this case, it wasn't an occurrence under the policy. But things have changed and we've seen a second wave of climate change litigation. Um, 13 suits were filed in 2018 and since then we have about 20 main climate change uh, lawsuits in the US. And this second wave has been more successful in that it had, the, the suits haven't been dismissed at an early stage. The main reason for that is the development of attribution science and we can now quantify each carbon major's respective share of global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, these suits, in their various forms, really all claim that various carbon majors created a public nuisance and should pay for damage arising from climate change and help build infrastructure running into billions of dollars to protect against future impact. They plead many issues. Rising sea levels is one of them. Really, that greenhouse gas emissions from the defendants' operations are causing global warming, rising sea levels and changes to the hydrological cycle it increased the severity of wildfires floods and all the other effects of climate change we're also seeing securities actions so two exxon cases are worth mentioning and these concern the financial position of exxon and the, de the, the deception in this case about the financial standing of the company that exxon kept two books one to internally reflect the true state of its uh, of, of its financial position and one that was public. And it was alleged that they made false statements about the company's climate risk. So this illustrates another way municipalities are using their own domestic legislation to try and hold companies responsible. That's the ultimate aim of all of these. They're just using a different basis for it. Now, the New York action was unsuccessful. The court found that the plaintiff had not actually shown that the statements had actually in fact misled any investor. What's interesting is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts brought a similar action against Exxon. And, and this is significant because the laws of Massachusetts allow a wider basis of claim. They actually allow misleading consumers. So again, the, the, this action's out there and it shows how plaintiffs are adapting. The current status of the litigation really in the US at the moment is that the main issue being litigated is actually just a technical one of where these cases should be heard. And this issue went before the Supreme Court in January this year in the Baltimore case and a decision is expected before the end of the year. Now, just by background, defendants prefer these to be heard in federal court because they're more likely to be dismissed outright at an early stage. And if not, there's a chance they'll ultimately get to the Supreme Court, which has a conservative majority. On the other hand, plaintiffs prefer state court. They feel they'll get a better hearing. Um, these suits are dealing with local damages, something that juries would be familiar with, and they're more likely to proceed further. And every time an action gets filed in state court by a plaintiff, defendants move to have it removed to federal court 
which decides whether it should stay there or get remanded back to state court. This is the ongoing argument. And the Supreme Court is seeking a review of this in the Baltimore case. Um, and the other lawsuits are really in effect stayed pending that outcome. Some officially and some are just really waiting because this ruling would determine the, the, the other courts how to proceed. And this judgment is going to be significant because it will indicate broadly how things are going to proceed in the states. But even if defendants are successful in the Baltimore action and federal court is considered the appropriate place for these sorts of cases, um, just much like everywhere else in the world, we're seeing cases brought on other bases. So one example is Juliana, also known as the kids case, which was brought on a rights basis. Um, and this was dismissed rather sympathetically by the court. And um, plaintiffs have now amended their complaint to address the deficiencies that were identified in the original. And they've filed that amended uh, complaint. So we're seeing cases being amended and certainly no sign of litigation abating. This chart here shows the current status of the main lawsuits in the US, and it's from the plaintiff firm Sheer Edling's website. Sheer Edling are responsible for bringing uh, most of these cases. Obviously, the other two databases of climate change litigation are the one that was mentioned, maintained by the Grantham Institute and also the Sabin Center in the States. Excuse me. And what this really looks like for the insurance industry <laughs> is a list of its premium policyholders. But the industry has seen this before. Um, the exposure to the industry, the insurance industry, looks a lot like other long tail pollution and environmental claims, um, asbestos, MTBE. And that's because most policies contain a pollution exclusion. The complicating factor, however, is when they have a product pollution liability exception, which writes back in, meaning pollution liability from the product's end use is actually covered. Now the MTB and asbestos lit, uh, litigation resulted in wordings being changed. We think that this litigation, the climate change litigation is going to look a lot like tobacco, really because of the issue of sustained deception and the timeline. With tobacco, we had a 50 year window between the first lawsuit and the first successful or meaningful judgment. Now we're already 10 years in to climate change litigation and in the context of today's society, it's quite unrealistic to think we'll have another 40 years to go before we see a major judgment against a carbon major. It's not unfeasible to think that we'll see judges interpreting laws to give a fair result. We've seen this before in other areas. So where next for climate change litigation? Well, what cases are we likely to see after the second wave? We're seeing a real-time amendment of actions to try and make things stick. Um, we're seeing this, for example, in the Massachusetts and Exxon action and the Juliana amended complaint. To the extent, uh, sorry, to the extent claims are being dismissed, they are being amended all the time. We're also likely to see more rights-based actions as we are in Europe, whereby plaintiffs aren't looking for damage or, or compensation, but they're looking to change corporate behavior. That's the goal. And plaintiffs have been increasingly creative with their, gar uh, their arguments. We're seeing that all around the world. Um, parallel to this, climate science is developing. So there's no sign of this abating. Um, we might also see subrogation actions. We might also see actions against other industries uh, as evidence develops. We might see a raft of DNO claims. Um, we're going to see a new era of, of climate litigation. So given that, where next for insurers? Well, first of all, it's absolutely crucial that the industry acknowledges the litigation risk. Um, there was a report published in January this year of guidance from the insurance industry to identify and disclose the impact of climate change on their business. And this followed a pilot of 22 insurers and reinsurers on implementing the TCFD recommendations. And that report acknowledged something we've been saying for a long time. that Insurers simply aren't focused on the issue of litigation risks because they haven't paid out claims based on climate change related litigation. In essence, they're betting on winning, the carbon major winning every lawsuit. There are, however, developments. Um, the Bank of England's PRA is undertaking a quantitative assessment of litigation risk. That hasn't been done before by the industry and the findings are due May this year. So whatever happens, it's very clear climate change exposure, it falls back onto the insurance industry and insurers are more exposed than other businesses to climate change. They must integrate climate risk at all levels of the decision making. 
they're subject to their own reporting requirements in terms of investment and underwriting claim side. And yet we don't always see this fully addressed with the, the ESG, but it's fundamental because insurers are picking up the bill. They must align corporate and underwriting and claim strategy because we have a paradox here whereby the industry is insuring industries and companies they're actually eroding their pockets in liability claims and threatening their very business and that's something that's going to become increasingly difficult to explain to shareholders but there's an opportunity here given the size of the insurance industry which is one of the largest uh, the largest global industries it holds around a third of all global economic assets and liabilities on its balance sheet it's in a very strong position to bring about that systemic change that we all want and shape behavior through investments, through incentives, through underwriting policies and new products. However, the industry itself has its own strategic and structural barriers that it needs to get around before it can make change. It also raises some of the bigger, perhaps more metaphysical questions. Should insurance indemnify a policyholder who's carried out a sustained deception over decades? Should climate change actually be insurable? Those are beyond the scope of, of our expertise, but ultimately insurance reflects the economy we have. And as long as hydrocarbons are part of our economy, there'll they'll be insurance. In this respect, it's very different from tobacco, MTB and asbestos. They could be removed from the food chain fairly easily. Hydrocarbons can't just be switched off. We're all dependent on them. So we really need to have a, a, and be thinking about a realistic transition away from the polluting energies to green tech Insurance is only, and it's always been, only the backdrop to a wider transitioning economy, but it can incentivize that transition. Um, that was brilliantly done, Deepa, exactly to 15 minutes. <laughs> and a fas <laughs> fascinating study of, of an, an aspect which I think we don't look at enough, and I certainly got a lot of questions I'd quite like to ask you about that. But thank you so much, that was brilliant. We now, I think, turn to Joanna, who I've already introduced. You'll be looking at it from a slightly different angle. Over to you, Joanna. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I'll set my timer here because Deepa did <laughs> so well and I don't want to lose track of time. Um, let me also share my screen with everyone. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm starting to make changes to my presentation, not yet. Sorry. Um, okay. All right, good. So hopefully you have my screen with you and um, my presentation um, is going to follow from what Deepa has presented in terms of looking at climate litigation and um, this time actually I was very happy to be invited to, to, to be part of this panel because whereas I'm, uh, I've often spoken about global trends in climate litigation, I like when I'm prompted, when I have this challenge of focusing on something specifically. So I this time was uh, had a, a good opportunity to look more closely at sea level rise litigation and uh, especially looking at that from a, a global south perspective. So I'll give you a very, very brief overview of what we know in terms of global litigation, but I will try to focus on, on, on these uh, particular trends. So um, uh, this is the slide I was changing without wanting. So very well, um, before I go into those specific cases, I wanted uh, to uh, basically remind you, in case this is not clear, that climate litigation involves uh, quite a, a wide variety of cases. It's not all about carbon majors, it's not ab all about suing uh, states like the agenda case. We have really uh, quite a heterogeneous group of cases that uh, involve both these uh, so-called strategic litigation, so um, cases that go beyond the individual litigant bringing the case and that seek to advance policies or drive behavior shifts or um, encourage the public debate even, 
um, to all the way to civil and administrative procedures that are brought in pursuit of private interests. So these might not involve activist intent, but they do bring climate change to courts. And, and examples of these are litigation seeking to hold, uh, uphold planning approvals, or um, even uh, we have a number of cases in the database about um, allocation of uh, EU allowances under the EU trading scheme. So hopefully this uh, is a reminder that when we talk about the total number of cases, it involves all of these. Um, so in terms of the total amount of cases, um, this is something, it's a study we publish every year where we look at uh, trends in, in litigation. And uh, this is from the, the la last 2020 report. We're currently working in the new one uh, with updated numbers, but uh, the, you won't be, uh, this won't change radically that the majority of cases is still very much concentrated in the US. So we have over 1,200 cases in the US and uh, other over 400 cases across the world. So this is something we know, and it's been happening for um, now a few decades. What has been a more recent trend, and that's relevant for, for my presentation today, is that we see climate litigation expanding to the global south. So um, more and more cases in South America, in Africa, in Southeast Asia. And this is something that we are picking uh, on our, with our database and uh, also trying to understand what is different about those cases and how perhaps they are also contributing to um, pushing forward this transnational uh, movement of climate litigation. Still looking at the total number of cases, uh, you can see how it is, climate litigation is a growing trend. So this graph is quite clear. You see it kind of starts uh, with a few cases in the early 90s, then 2000s, and, and it just goes up and up. And we can only expect that this will continue to grow. Um, and, and here you can see the US, non-US uh, distinction. But what's interesting is that more than half of the cases uh, recorded have been brought since 2015. So really since 2015, as Deepa mentioned, we, we see uh, climate litigation becoming stronger, more present to the point that now there's no way that insurers or governments uh, can pretend that this is not happening. So climate litigation became not only a fact, as Deepa said, but also a, an increasing risk to a number of actors. Um, this is the report that I mentioned that we publish every year. So keep an eye for July, 2021, when we'll uh, launch the new one. Very well. Where we find all these cases in the databases that have been mentioned. So the GRI one that uh, has over uh, 2,000 laws and policies, all climate-related climate laws and policies from around the world. And uh, we have, this is from yesterday, uh, 1,775 cases of litigation worldwide. The uh, Sabin database also has the US, uh, the details of each US case, which we don't have. But just to show you, uh, yesterday I was, as I was preparing this presentation, I typed sea level rise here in the search button. And uh, I had 28 results. So we currently have 28 cases that have brought issues of sea level rise uh, outside of the US only. Um, what are these cases? Well, it's, I will go into a few of them, but uh, a majority of cases in Australia, um, some international cases, and a few cases around the global south. So I'll tell you more about these. Before that, just to explain how we define climate litigation, that's um, a methodological question, but also an important one because we do end up excluding a number of cases that particularly for the topic of this presentation, sea level rise in the global south, uh, as a result, we, we end up not picking many of, of uh, cases that I'm sure exist. So um, we don't include in our databases uh, cases where climate is incidental. So sea level rise, uh, its impacts and it can be uh, wide. 
So uh, in terms of uh, affecting existing constructions or in planning applications, but if the case is not ha doesn't have the word climate change and a, a, a discussion around the causes of sea level rise, that wouldn't be picked by the databases. Um, and more generally, cases dealing with adaptation and disaster recovery that don't have explicitly the word climate change are not included. So th this um, framing affects particularly case collection in the global south, where a number of cases that are brought might not have climate change on the filing or on the decision, but very much already reflect the fact that uh, populations and cities are suffering the impacts of climate change, as well as particularly of sea level rise. This is a point that I make in the, in the paper that was published um, like two years ago, this one that is there on the screen. So with that in mind, let me present to you a few cases and I have very little time. So I'll go briefly um, through the sea level rise displacement litigation in the global south. There are a few very interesting cases that have been filed recently that deal with this issue of displacement. People that are being forced to move and therefore are bringing cases in domestic courts and also in the Teotihuacan case uh, that went all the way to the UN Human Rights Committee. So uh, the first case in, uh, from a family from Tuvalu and the second one, um, Teotihuacan from Kiribati, are cases where the islanders are uh, seeking asylum in New Zealand because their islands are at risk of disappearing due to sea level rise. Um, these cases are quite interesting in that they uh, show the limitations of the existing international frameworks and also domestic legislation to deal with people that are displaced because of climate change. And the decisions that we've seen basically um, are, um, they still allow for uh, maybe future cases to be brought on these bases, but they, uh, particularly the last one, the Teotihuacan case that was decided in January 2020, uh, found that the effects might expose the individuals to a violation of, of their rights, but that the, because the, the effects, the sea, actually the effects of sea level rise won't be felt in 10 to 15 years, there should be enough time for the governments to take measures and therefore it shouldn't be, oh, I see an alarm. This is my alarm. Okay, stop. Cancel. Now I need to stop the alarm. Okay. <laughs> the alarm is not stopping. I'll throw it outside. Um, so um, these are the two cases that are really sea level rise displacement in the global south. I want to very, very briefly, and I'm sorry, I will take two minutes extra, uh, Robert, to say that there are other cases that deal with sea level rise and vulnerable groups, but that are involving countries in the global north. And these are the, for example, the Torres Strait climate uh, case that was filed against Australia, but uh, brought by this group of islanders saying that the government, the Australian government is uh, not taking the necessary resilience measures to protect the islanders. And a very recent case that was filed a, a few months ago by a group of Indian tribes in the US uh, who submitted a complaint to a number of UN special rapporteurs uh, complaining that the US government similarly is uh, not including these populations in decision-making processes and not uh, also uh, having enough funding and measures to protect these uh, tribes from the effects of climate change. Um, both cases are ongoing and, and we'll see, uh, particularly with the first one, with the one against Australia, what the outcomes might be, which might be quite influential. Now to finish, um, I want to finish with a question, which is why don't we see more of this type of litigation in the global south? We all know that those populations contributed less, they are suffering more, and a number of these cases are particularly at risk at, uh, of sea level rise. So there are endless 
uh, scientific publications, and here is just one example of uh, one that shows that the effects of uh, vulnerability to sea level rise to those communities is it's very important and uh, quite extreme in countries such as Jamaica, Cuba, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, etc. And still, we see very few cases. So. In that paper that I mentioned, I had a few hypotheses for that. And I will finish with this, these hypotheses. I don't want to take more time. Uh, one is that these countries lack expertise, both legal, so lawyers who know how to bring these cases, and technical, because there are often not enough domestic uh, national studies and data to support those cases. Secondly, uh, it, it, they also need uh, financial resources. It's very expensive to bring litigation and often it's not a priority in these countries to, to be bringing cases to court. And, and lastly, a point that I like making, which is in many of these countries, litigants are afraid of bringing cases. Um, there, there is uh, not, it's not uncommon to have prosecution and even killings of environmental activists who um, use different tools to, um, uh, from protesting to bringing lawsuits uh, in, in such countries. So I'm happy to, uh, after in the Q&A, to give you more details about some of these other question uh, cases in the Global South that I have identified, such as the one involving mangroves in Brazil and this Adani port in India, all dealing with sea level rise in courts in the Global South. But my key message is, is that it's still very, very limited the number of cases that we see in the Global South. So I will stop here and um, I'm looking forward to Q and A's. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Joanna. Your alarm was seen to be rather unfair. It was set rather early, I thought. So you actually <laughs> might have had a minute or two more. And I think we might, I'd like to come back um, when you, when we get on to Q and A's on to, to the Brazilian experience, because I think there's been a very important case in the Brazilian Supreme Court, which we're waiting for the judgment on. So we might come back to that. But thank you very much. That was very interesting. And we'll now turn straight to, to Alex Goodman, who's going to talk more about the UK experience. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I hope you can see my screen, can you? Yes, we can see it, although it's rather, it's not a full screen yet, but it may, it's rather small, I think. Oh, thank you. I'll, um... Yes. So over the past year in the UK, uh, climate change has become a far more prominent theme of environmental litigation. That it's become more prominent, I, I would suggest, is a function of two particular factors. The desperation of campaigners on the issue and the contradictions and tensions within state policies and practices. And when I was given this uh, theme to think about, sea level rise, there aren't a lot of cases in the UK on that. And so uh, my focus is going to be on climate change, the cause of sea level rise and the efforts being taken by uh, campaigning litigation in relation to that. And it brought to mind one of the great foundation myths of Britain, which is that in 1027, King Canute displayed his wisdom by demonstrating uh, that man could not control the rising of the sea. <laughs> but the scientific consensus a thousand years later is that's no longer true. We are now in a position to control the extent of sea level rise by limiting our impact on the warming of the earth. And the UK courts align with the science on this issue, and I've put up the divisional court summary of the concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere is directly linked to average global temperatures. The concentration of GHGs has been rising steadily and with it mean global temperatures. Since the start of the Industrial Revolution, and the most abundant GHG, accounting for at least two thirds of all GHGs is CO2, which is largely the product of burning fossil fuels. The increase in global temperature has resulted in amongst other things, sea level change, a declining glaciers, the Antarctic ice sheet and Arctic sea ice, alterations to various ecosystems, and in some areas, areas a threat to food and water supplies. It's potentially 
catastrophic. I've put all the slides up on the landmark website. So all of the references in this, you don't need to note them down, you can find them there. Um, I've got very many more references that I'm going to be able to go with, through in the time, but my hope was that by noting them down, you've got them for future reference. In the UK, uh, the Environment Agency is in charge of the issues around water level rises, whether by flooding, river flooding, sea flooding, or um, from um, surface water, that's more, more rain, more atmospheric water. And they estimate that there'll be a 1.55 meter rise in sea levels around the UK over the next 100 years. And I've given the uh, link to that. Uh, and the consequence of existing rises is, is being felt now in uh, one-off events, for example, extensive flooding in high tides um, in Hull in June 2007. It's a very good example, Hull, much of it but just below sea level. Uh, and so one sees in Hull something called the Shorelines Project, is a, a community arts project by Rights of Community Action trying to raise consciousness of the threat to that city. Um, but it's not just the East Coast that's a threat, it's considered there are around 5 million people in the UK at risk from flooding and coastal erosion. And the Environment Agency puts estimates to address that at a billion pounds per year for the next um, 50 years, just to mitigate uh, those impacts. The environmental movement has been campaigning on this for, of course, many years. Uh, and without much success, we are, we're still in a position of increasing the usage of fossil fuels, uh, globally speaking. Uh, and we've probably now passed the point at which we can limit global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. But with a huge global effort, we may still be able to keep it below two degrees. And if we can do that, then the science suggests we can avoid the breakdown of the ecosystem. And it's that sort of moment where litigation comes into play in the UK. Um, because in the British administrative legal system, administrative law is, is always to be a measure of last resort. Uh, and we really are in the uh, last, uh, last resort now. Um, and, and so one sees campaigning uh, claims being brought, resorting to or relying on fundamental or constitutional rights, constitutional minima. Um, one has to understand the context for litigation, and I set out there an important uh, passage from the Rights Community Action case last year from the Divisional Court, making clear the court is only concerned with legal issues raised by the claimant as to whether a defendant has acted unlawfully. It doesn't go into the political realm at all. Um, but the climate movement now finds itself increasingly in the courts uh, as a measure of last, last resort. Now, unlike the uh, talk we just heard from Deeper, uh, in relation to litigation in the US. Most litigation in the UK challenges governmental decisions either on individual schemes. So an example I'm going to turn to shortly is Client Earth's challenge to the Drax gas fire uh, power station or to wider policies and the Good Law Project uh, challenge to the national policy statements for energy is a good example of that. Private law litigation around climate change is much rarer in the UK partly a function of the way the costs regime works. We have a very straightforward system of cost protection under uh, implementing the Aarhus Convention for judicial review, that's administrative law, public law cases. Uh, but the, although the Aarhus Convention does apply to claims in nuisance, uh, the ability to get a protective costs order in, those, in that sort of context is, is more complex. Um, there's a case called Austin and Miller Argent, South Wales, 2015, 1WLR, 52, if you're interested in looking at the Court of Appeals thoughts on that. So just before I come to the case law, I've just put a slide of some of the main provisions of legislation. Uh, the most important one is the third down, section one of the Climate Change Act 2008 in the UK, which set an emissions reduction tar target of 80% uh, reduction by 2050 against the 1990 baseline. That was amended in 2019 to a 100% reduction against 1990 baseline by 2050, uh, which is actually a highly significant uh, change and is estimated by the Committee on Climate Change, the Parliamentary Committee on Climate Change, to equate to 
uh, requiring the 80%, the former 80% number to be hit 15 years earlier, in other words, by 2035. So we've halved the time that we were previously anticipating for our emissions reductions in the last year. So I should probably start with the Supreme Court's judgment uh, reversing the Court of Appeal in the Friends of the Earth case concerning the airport's national policy statement, which is primarily concerned with a new runway at Heathrow. The Court of Appeal had held that the Paris Agreement was a component of government policy and that the Secretary of State was obliged, therefore, by Section 58 of the Planning Act 2008 to take account of it in designating the airport's national policy statement. This was before the, the new statutory target in the uh, Climate Change Act was adopted. Uh, the government didn't appeal that judgment of the Court of Appeal, and accepted it, but the uh, developer Heathrow Airports did. And the Supreme Court gave a judgment of the court delivered jointly by Lord Hodge and Lord Sales, in which they reversed the Court of Appeal, held at paragraph 122, the UK's obligations under the Paris Agreement were given effect in domestic law in that the existing carbon target, that's the old 80% target, and the carbon budgets that had been set under Section 4. Uh, and so the uh, government had, had complied with its duties under the Climate Change Act and under the Planning Act in uh, adopting the airport and designating the airport's NPS. Uh, the Paris Agreement itself didn't give rise to legal rights or obligations over and above the domestic provisions. Uh, it was also held as a matter of fact that the Paris Agreement had been taken into account. Um, so that's just where that litigation got to in the Supreme Court. Um, it has, however, raised the issue on the back of that judgment. Well, given that the Section 1 target as to the reduction by 100% now, by 2050, as opposed to 80%, has been amended since the airport's national policy statement was designated. Doesn't that now need to be taken into account? And there is under section six and 11 of the airports, of, of the Planning Act, a continuing duty to take account of uh, new material considerations. And so uh, a number of parties have raised that, including um, the Good Law Project and George Monbiot. Uh, and it looks that that may be heading for further litigation. Uh, next, the, um, I'll just quickly mention the Urgenda case, Supreme Court of the Netherlands confirmed that the failure of the Dutch government to act to reduce climate change by at least 25% amounted to a failure to protect rights to life and to a home under Articles 2 and 8 of the ECHR. And of course, that's relevant to the UK because we're a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights and because it's incorporated in domestically through the Human Rights Act. Uh, I think what would perhaps, I mean, that conclusion is a bold one, not one one would expect to see in a UK court, but what was even more surprising to a UK lawyer is the translation of that uh, human rights obligation to a specific requirement on the Dutch government to reduce a specific proportion of emissions. Uh, I've cited another case which is following on from that, uh, quite an interesting, uh, originated in Portugal, but involves 33 countries uh, now in the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, next, the Plan uh, B and others case. Um, I've, I've cited that as a contrast really to agenda. This was an earlier challenge by Plan B, separate to the Heathrow case, where they alleged the failure to amend the emissions reduction target, which I've already mentioned and has now been amended, uh, was a violation of Articles 2 and 8 ECHR. And that was actually refused permission. It was held to be unarguable, Ms. Justice Supperston saying that this is an area where the executive, that means the government, has a wide discretion echoing the spirit of the margin of appreciation as applied by the European Court of Human Rights and the traditional deference of UK courts to administrative decision makers. And I cited an interesting article on that. Uh, so that really shows the contrast between the Netherlands Supreme Court where uh, and, and the domestic approach in the UK. Um, the four successful claims in the UK are what I'm going to then focus on for the remainder of my time. Uh, in the rest of the slides, you'll see there are a lot of other claims that relate to climate change um, that have been unsuccessful, but they do indicate 
uh, something of a slew of litigation recently. Uh, the first was the case I was involved with for Dale Vince, George Monbiot and the Good Law Project that related to energy national policy statements. The argument was that it frustrated the exercise of the power, uh, powers in the uh, Planning Act 2008 to continue to rely on outdated policy statements from 2011 in light of the way both the science and the domestic legislation had moved on. In the event, uh, the Secretary of State has now agreed to review energy policy, and so that litigation was settled. There was an outstanding issue around whether it should be uh, suspended pending the uh, review, but uh, that was decided not to be pursued. Another recently settled case was a challenge by Irma's Dawes to a development consent order under the Planning Act for the development of, 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 of Manston Airport. And the Secretary of State has conceded that his reasons were inadequate, uh, in particular relating to consideration of climate change. And I've given a link to the consent order. That's now going to be reconsidered. The McLennan case, extremely interesting. Uh, it's a, a very small development at issue. Uh, a neighbour objected to his next door neighbour's development, saying that the uh, house built, being built next to him would shadow his solar panels and deny his ability to contribute towards mitigating climate change. The local authority said that that's a purely private interest, no relevance to planning. And Mr Justice Lane overruled that and said, no, it's part of the wider matter that is a material consideration, uh, which is the uh, uh, mitigation of climate change. And so it does establish uh, an important point, actually, that mitigation of climate change is, is both a material consideration, but, but also one that's capable of requiring a decision to be quashed if it's not taken into consideration. So it's one of those forms of material consideration where it, it, can, it can give rise to a situation that um, a, a failure to take it into account um, requires the decision then uh, to be retaken. Uh, uh, then the uh, next um, successful case, this is the fourth successful case, is the Stevenson case. And this was a challenge to the National Planning Policy Framework paragraph related to fracking policy. And the court found the government had failed to take into account scientific evidence put forward by the claimants. In fact, uh, it found that the uh, consultation had not proceeded with an open mind um, and so um, uh, had failed to take into account the evidence at a formative stage rather than as a mere uh, after the after the event add on. Uh, and so um, there was a quashing of paragraph 209 of the National Planning Policy Framework. Um, so I'm reaching my uh, allotted time, but what I've done is, I knew this would happen, I now noted down all the other cases of interest. So there's the Packham case, which was on HS2, about a failure to take account of the Paris Agreement, that uh, didn't succeed either in the High Court or the Court of Appeal. There's a recent case called Finch, that says that uh, it is not a material consideration to consider uh, the downstream effects. So this was a planning permission for an oil well. The fact that the oil, when burned, would have impacts on the climate wasn't a matter that had to be taken into account in the environmental impact assessment. Uh, Abbott's Carswell was a challenge to a, a housing scheme uh, and failed on the facts, uh, but there was a challenge on climate change grounds. Similarly, Hewitt, another challenge to a housing scheme. Again, they had the, the, the climate change impacts had in fact been considered. Plan B Earth proposes a new claim, which you can see on my slides later date. And then there are four final cases in the pipeline. The Transport Action Network is challenging the uh, uh, roads policy. Friends of the Earth is proposing a challenge to a mega project in Mozambique by way of challenging the use of public funds from the UK to support that project. It's quite an unusual case. Uh, there's, a, there's going to be a called in public inquiry concerning the West Cumbria coal mine that's just been announced and permission has been granted uh, in a challenge to the post Brexit replacement of the emissions trading scheme, again, based on the Paris Agreement. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, 
Alex. I was wondering how you managed to get through all that in the time, but you did very well. And I think it was very interesting looking at those four cases, which were successful in different ways, actually. What you did, I think, illustrate is how success can come in very different ways. And, in, and indeed, in some cases, as a result of a case being settled. And even there's a sort of local case of the lady whose um, solar panels were being impeded. As it shows at even at a really small level that this can become important. So thank you very much for that. Now, that you've all done very, very well. And so we have got um, certainly sort of 25 minutes or so left for further questions. Um, Ivano, do you have any sort of questions lined up you want to, uh, to put? Yes, uh, yes, Robert, there is, uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is from Andreas Osli. I hope that is the right pronunciation. Uh, can you briefly repeat, repeat what type of insurance would cover litigation cost losses in climate change litigation? Also, to what extent are uh, director and officer policies relevant? Thanks. I think this is for Dita. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, I can leave a, let's, a reply. Let's, let's, have, let's ask Deepa about that. Yeah. Um, can you help Deepa on the sort of insurance policies which would be relevant? So, we, I mean, Climate change impact is going to, to affect anything. We're going to see pro property damage uh, policies and, and business interruption. We're going to see professional indemnity uh, claims. So, for example, against architects who didn't design adequate sea defences, against auditors who um, didn't spot, you know, bad climate disclosures in accounts. Um, uh, and all sorts of professionals like that. Obviously, liability is the main one because that's that's the big one, and that's the the, the uncertainty that's that's lying out there. Um, and it's a liability policy that will cover under the duty to defend the um, the litigation costs, um, particularly in the US. There's a difference between the US and and uh, England here. I'm not a US lawyer, so I'm going to keep it a very broad <laughs> overview, but essentially the duty to defend in the US is very, very wide um, and insurers on tricky ground if they try to refuse that. In the UK, sorry, in England and Wales, there's not a general duty, it's only really a contractual duty if it's under the policy, but that's what comes into play for the litigation costs. Um, in terms of DNO, we, we get asked this a lot, and in truth, we haven't seen any major DNO cases out there yet. And I say yet because it is, it's it's prime for the take and it's going to be a matter of time before plaintiffs turn their attention that way. Um, yeah. Essentially, directors have to exercise due care, skill, and diligence in the performance of their roles. So when we have uh, issues of failure to mitigate, failure to, to adapt, failure to, to physical risks, but also failure to adapt investment strategies. Um, failure to disclose climate related risks um, and failure to comply with uh, environmental regulations. All those grounds are ripe for plaintiffs to jump on and start uh, making claims against uh, directors and officers. As I said, at this stage, there's no major DNO claims out there that we're aware of. There have been some sort of spin off claims in the US uh, from, the, from the Exxon action. Um, but, there, but there's nothing major at the moment, but that's certainly, we think, one of the next grounds and, and probably Joanna as well, um, who has her radar all over for the wide spectrum. Um, she might want to add something on that, I don't know. Right. Joanna, do you want to say anything about that? Um, well, I can, and then maybe there's a second question that I believe it's is for me, so I can maybe... Uh... Okay, well, let's get Ivana to set the second question. Okay. Yeah, the second question, I think it's for Joanna, but yeah. Yeah, what role does... Yeah, so Jean-Pierre Gossi, from Jean-Pierre Gossi, what role does civil society play in a strategic litigation on climate litigation? And is this something that can help explain the relatively low number of cases in the global south. Conversely, we see in various places a decline in civic space. Is this something that has impacted climate litigation and numbers thereof? <laughs> Different questions. Thank you, Joanna. 
Thanks. Uh, so before I go into Jean-Pierre's uh, question uh, on what Deepa said, I think it's really important how the um, attention now is shifting towards the insurance sector. Uh, as she said, both from the side of insurers covering uh, losses, but also as investors. And the fact that the Bank of England and uh, UNEP are writing these reports uh, just demonstrates that. Uh, what I find fascinating about this type of litigation is how wide it is. Mm. I think it's the widest type of climate litigation we can think exactly because it goes from uh, the architect who, who might uh, who, who didn't consider climate to the director uh, all the way to uh, the lawyers. And uh, it, it just seems to be the most comprehensive type of climate litigation. And therefore I, I completely understand why there is now a concern to measure the risk. What I'm afraid that uh, is that uh, some attempts to measure litigation risk for the sector uh, just look merely at the cost of one lawsuit. And as we know, climate litigation have many more costs than just one particular case. So if you look at the Saul Luciano Liuya case, you know, it's 20,000 euros. That case would be completely irrelevant for uh, an insurance company. But as we all know, that's all about, that's what strategic litigation is about. It's much more than just 20,000. What that case is trying to do is to show the whole uh, apply attribution science into how one company might respond to a damage that took place uh, in a remote part of the world. So that's something that I, I see um, companies and insurers still not quite understanding or still not wanting to see uh, in maybe a bit of a denial that uh, just the, the, the amount of involved in one particular lawsuit is not really representative of all of the of what climate litigation uh, is about. Um, so now I I, I move to Can my. I know, Your Honor, before you move on, I see we've been joined by Jason Reeves, um, who is uh, a managing partner of the London office of Zeller, therefore works with Deepa, who has been tied up in a mediation. I'm not sure, Jason, whether your equipment allows you to come in. I think you seem to have unmuted yourself now. Before I'm we, here. Do you want to add anything to that point we were discussing then about sort of what the Joanna was saying about I, the sort of limited perception of litigation by insurers? Yeah, I have a funny story for everybody, which I think you'll find entertaining. Um, Deep and I did a, a, a presentation for um, a group of insurers uh, last year, and uh, we were discussing the theoretical issues around uh, the RWE claim, which I'm sure you guys have uh, mentioned at some stage in this. Uh, and I'll, uh, pardon me if Deepa's mentioned this, but um, you know, I think the total claim there is less than 20,000 euros, correct? And so, you know, uh, we got asked by an insurer who said, "Well, the right thing to do is to pay that claim." We always just, we, why would why would we do anything other than just pay a claim like that? We're not going to litigate over that. And of course. That really misses the wood for the trees because of course it's test case and if you pay one peruvian farmer twenty thousand euros you've suddenly opened yourself up to the entire world uh you know who, who are bringing claims and so it, it, joanna is absolutely right it is not about the uh, uh individual specific claims it's about the tidal wave of claims and the change in how people are going to approach uh, uh uh, both policyholders and then those policyholders approaching their insurers. And it's not business as normal uh, for insurers with this. We're on the precipice of what I think is going to be a huge claims event for insurers. Uh, and we're going to see that in the liability context. We're going to see it in the subrogation context. And we're going to continue to see it in the modeling actuarial and physical impacts losses uh, for catastrophes going forward. So. Um, Thank you very much. Yes, I think, I mean, the RWE case is the case in Germany, which was brought by the Peruvian farmer, Mr. Luya, which Joanna mentioned, who's, as you say, suing the biggest German producer, electrical <coughs> industry, for damage allegedly caused by melting glaciers in Peru. And the 20,000, I think, represents a sort of point, what is it, 0.47% or something of global emissions. But obviously, as you say, if that succeeds, then an awful lot of other people will be looking at their uh, position. 
So, um, Joanna, shall we go back to the second question, which I think was for you? Sure. Yeah, it's um, a very good question by Jean-Pierre about the role of civil society in litigation. So the first part of the question is how civil society can get involved. And, and uh, we've been seeing some really interesting ways through which civil society broadly are getting involved in litigation, uh, which is something I find uh, fascinating also about this whole movement. So the first one is uh, citizens are directly supporting litigation. So um, I think the, the one of the best examples is the French case, Notre Affaire à tous, uh, against uh, the state, uh, the French government. And that case was supported by over 2 million French citizens. If I'm not mistaken, they, it took them a couple of weeks only to get all those signatures. Um, and, and there's another one in Belgium where they have 60, 100,000, so not as many, but it's, uh, I, I read recently that that's, um, so 60, 100,000 citizens who officially registered as co-claimants in the Belgium case against the government, making it the largest uh, lawsuit in Belgium in history. So you see how these cases are really bringing citizens to courts in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, the other in poss possibility for people to get involved is by funding litigation, which is another very uh, interesting way of getting involved. So you can imagine that some people basically prefer not to go and protest on the streets. They want to, they think that litigation is indeed a good way to pressure governments or corporations. And what they're doing is they're funding some of these cases. And there's something called uh, crowd justice, which um, was the main funding for the Portuguese case, the, the case that brought by children against 33 states that Alex mentioned, that case was crowdfunded. So you have people from all around the world funding uh, barristers and lawyers to, to bring a case. And this shows really how civil society uh, it, it are getting involved in um, litigation through a number of different channels. Now, um, the, the question of uh, why we don't see so much in the global south is, is, is an important question. And in, in my view, one of the key reasons for that is that climate change is still quite low on the list of priorities of a number of these countries. So in terms of uh, there are first all the social economic problems, education, uh, uh, housing, and then in terms of environmental problems, there's waste, access to clean water and uh, air pollution. So in many of these countries, talking about climate change is still something that is something that people in the North are worried about or that, you know, maybe it will affect us, but it doesn't affect us now. So, you know, let's focus on what matters at the, in this immediate moment. So um, that's something that is starting to change. And together with that change, we see how it's also um, the, the cases are increasing. It used to be uh, a decision of litigants not to bring climate change in a case exactly because they knew that courts weren't ready for that in the global south and that you wouldn't get support from citizens by bringing a climate case. This is changing. We see more and more litigation. So in uh, we were talking, Robert mentioned that, that there are really interesting cases in Brazil and uh, these cases uh, are initially were very much focused on individual situations of uh, one per one case of deforestation. So one lawsuit filed against that one person who uh, cuts down some trees. And now we see cases brought by, against the government for inaction, for omission, for not implementing uh, the climate policy that is already that already exists, cases that are uh, linked to the constitutional right to a, a healthy environment. So climate litigation in the South is becoming more complex and evolving as uh, together at the same time as society, I think, becomes more concerned. That would be my answer. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, Alex, I wonder, is crowdfunding, do you know, happening in this country in, in, in UK yeah. or is that? Yeah, so I mean, I, I do quite a lot of crowdfunded cases now, and because it can be organised over crowd justice or a similar kind of website, it's highly e efficient. Um, one of the cases recently brought by the Good Law Project um, concerning the uh, dispensing of um, uh, contracts without proper 
publication. Uh, I think they managed to raise over a quarter of a million pounds by the time they got to a preliminary hearing uh, when they were applying for a cost capping order. And the judge said, well, I'm going to cost it. I'm going to cap you a quarter of a million pounds then because I can see on your website how much <laughs> money you've already raised. Um, so uh, it, it, it is facilitating a lot more uh, availability of, of litigation, whether on a national sort of scale or, or, or locally. So one can see just in this in relation to the kind of question that's being asked about uh, the involvement of civil society that often what fires people up are much more local issues so a lot of litigation tends to focus in the UK around things like opposition to a new uh, fracking proposal in a given region and then the opposition comes to some extent from national organizations like friends of the earth but the litigation actually tends to be run then by a local community in opposition to it who can then use uh, crowdfunding um, and that seems to be much more effective in actually achieving results in the uk context as well where you have a form of political pressure from ordinary people who are affected that seems to then um, in terms of tangible outcomes be more significant than for example, the amazing litigation work done by Client Earth on air quality, which is actually in terms of substantive results in air quality, been quite slow to take effect. So um, I think that that confluence of political or you know civil pressure with litigation is is, the, is what really makes a change, um, especially in the UK. I, I'm not so aware of the rest of the world as everyone else. But thank you. Um, back, Ivana, back to you. Any further questions? Yeah, yeah we have uh, other questions. So, uh, from um, Mr. Winkert, uh, long question. The drugs case was interesting in so far as permission has been granted for this bill to go ahead. Although the company has now apparently decided not, to not proceed, having established that there is a need for fossil fuel generation in order to meet greenhouse gas reduction targets, is there a danger that the UK will end up in a situation where it is very unlikely to reach its greenhouse gas reduction tar targets? Maybe for Alex. And in this case, apart from political pressure, what sanction is there against the government? So, yeah, if I just pick that up, shall I? Um, Please. If I yeah. Uh, yeah. The, I mean, the, the, the question is picked up on this point that in our existing energy policy, there is a presumption in favour of fossil fuel development. It's quite an extraordinary position to still be in. And that was the focus of the energy NPS challenges that at a policy level to be maintaining a presumption in favour of fossil fuels seems rather out of date and out of keeping with the times. And the government has now conceded to review that policy. And so we can expect within a year or so um, that that will um, be designated the new policy and will obviously have a, a, a less strong presumption if indeed it has a presumption at all in favour of fossil fuels. The I, I think the pressure of litigation here and the kind of ratchet effect of the direction towards reductions of emissions is actually having quite a bearing on implementation of permissions because if you're looking at something like a gas-fired power station you're expecting at least a 30 year horizon. But of course, by 2050, we're supposed to be at net zero. And so anyone who's gonna invest all that money is gonna be losing confidence that there won't be some regulatory uh, impact on it further down the line. And so it, it, it's one area where having very distant targets that feels like, oh gosh, they've just put it off for 30 years so that they don't have to think about it until the night before. But actually those distant targets do start to bear on infrastructure, which has a very long-term horizon. Thank you. All right, next, Ivano. Yeah, if I may, can I ask a question for by myself? Please. <laughs> uh, there is a question that I want to ask to all speakers. So it starts from an issue which was considered in each of your presentation, the separation of powers, uh, as a light in the Juliana case, uh, as they said by, by Deepa, also Joanna talked about this, or in uh, the rights community action case last year. So do you think that uh, considering the different legal systems, there is space for evolution on, the, on that, on this doctrine? Also, what is the, the, ma uh, the, main, uh, the main difference within the litigation in the Global South? So this is for Joanna, of course. Well, let's, um, on the question of separation of powers, 
uh, I don't know. I mean, perhaps over to Jason, I mean, in the, in the American context, um, we've got, as, as I think Deepa was saying, a sort of conservative, inverted commas, slant in the Supreme Court. Um, so that a case like Massachusetts and EPA might not have gone the same way today. But, um, and the Juliana case was very much, although a sympathetic court, they said, well, actually, this has got to be a matter for the administration, even if the administration under Mr. Trump is not doing anything about it. Um, how do you see it? I mean, perhaps, should I ask Jason or Deacon? Perhaps Jason, because he's coming late, and he comes, he's an American smart. How do you see this sort of working out in the USA, which, where there's more litigation than anywhere else? Yeah, I, I, I think this is a process, uh, and it's a process where um, we're going to continue to see the refinement and amendment of lawsuits until there's traction. Um, the world is moving very quickly, and I think that even with a conservative judiciary at the federal level, I think that you know we're not having the same discussions about climate change now that we had five years ago or 10 years ago. And I think the courts will change and develop and reflect what society sees and feels and believes. I think that's a normal, natural uh, uh, part of um, sort of a legal evolution. And what is today uh, unthinkable in tort law um, is tomorrow's uh, you know, uh, 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 benchmark uh, new case. Uh, and we can list those kinds of examples in virtually every common law jurisdiction where there's been a, a turn in how people have seen things because there's a belief that there's a fundamental unfairness to how tort law has been interpreted for years. I can think of the Fairchild case here uh, in the UK in connection with asbestos, where suddenly, uh, you know, uh, how tort law had been interpreted uh, was fundamentally upended. And I think we're going to see something like that um, because the legislature is not uh, stepping up. Uh, I also think we're likely to see that in connection with uh, remedies under state law. And uh, those remedies under state law in the United States uh, won't be subject to uh, a, a very conservative Supreme Court uh, at the federal level. Uh, and I think that's where, you know, to use Alex's point, uh, people are more interested in the local. And, you know, I, I think that's going to, to, to get more traction. The last thing I would say is that one of the creative ways that these things are being amended, and I think Deepa and I think Joanne has mentioned this, is you know that that, that in common law jurisdictions we're likely to see uh, a, a attack to an approach of looking at constitutional remedies uh, that citizens have rights that the government should protect, in the same way that the Urgenda cases and the other uh, uh, European cases uh, really approach climate change. So they're not after a big pot of money; they're after structural change. Yeah, thank you. Um, Alex, um, can I just turn to you on the same sort of bit? I don't know whether you want to add anything on that from the UK perspective. But, I mean, you didn't mention what I would have thought is a big elephant in the room, which is the um, Climate Change Act and the Climate Change Committee's recommendations for the sixth budget, which are currently before the government, and they're going to have to produce a response by... 30th of June, that's the budget taking us up to 30, no, 2037. Um, and with the government being under quite a lot of pressure with COP26 coming up at the end of the year, and do, how do you, do you think that's going to affect the sort of balance of perception as between the government and the courts? I mean, I, th I think that the, um, the Heathrow case is an example of a reaffirmation of, of a much more orthodox position um, from the courts in, in, in terms of deference to um, executive and, 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 and legislature. Um, I mean, COP clearly is, is coming up and um, the airport situation now following Heathrow is that there's this policy in place which has been found by the Supreme Court to be lawful but which hasn't taken account of the legislature's latest change to our to our target uh, which has then factored into what the Committee on Climate Change has said in its in its sixth um, uh, carb about its sixth carbon budget so which was published in December uh, and so it does seem that those two things put together form quite a compelling basis for the 
executive to have to review policy on on airports only having been designated three years ago uh, and with the cop coming up as well uh, I, I would imagine there'll be a political will to try and put us in a more um, a better light before the world comes to descend on our country and, and, and scrutinizes what we're doing because it's difficult to host a conference like that if, if we are still in the position we're in come that time so uh, I mean just in terms of the political pressure I think I think that's likely um, I mean Robert can I ask you I mean you, I'm sure you've got some interesting thoughts on separation of powers in the UK and I, I want <laughs> you know, if not I to ask you no one else is going uh, to so, well uh, I, outside this particular exchange you can I'm going to stick to my position as chair and I think turn to I mean it's fair to say of the Heathrow case that they weren't saying that they were just simply saying that in terms of the particular stage in the policy process, the government had not done anything unlawful. But I think they they made quite clear that the changes in climate change policy have got to be taken into account as the as the scheme proceeds. So uh, I don't think they've shut that out. But but Joanne, I'm over to you then, looking at it from a sort of global south perspective. Sure. So I think from the global south perspective, the separation of powers have hasn't been a, a, a big problem in in most cases yet, and I I would say that one of the reasons for that, uh, Jason mentioned how many of these uh, cases now, especially in the last five years, are. Uh, rights-based cases, so cases that are brought based on fundamental rights, especially in countries that have uh, the protecting the environment in their constitution. So those cases, those countries um, actually make it easier for um, uh, the case not to be challenged under those grounds because it becomes an obligation of the state to protect the environment that's set in the constitution and therefore the judge is in a more more comfortable position of basically saying, well, you know, these are the, the, the most important rights is protecting human life and human dignity. And therefore, it, we have to do we have to look into this case, the court has a duty also to 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 look into the case. And, and I think that's probably most clear. And um, I, I don't think we'll see anything like that, actually, as in the Ligari case in Pakistan, where uh, the judge not only uh, decided that the case was um, that that indeed the government had to do more, but the judge himself rolled up his sleeves and decided to set up a committee. And he sat on that committee, and he only left when he felt that things were happening. So, <laughs> if, if you if you think separation of powers is a problem, then look at the Ligari case. That's you know that's really how um, you can see the urgency of climate change becoming uh, very much uh, being embraced by the judge. And I think that addresses another question that was asked about activist judges. So I just wanted to mention uh, that uh, because it reminded me of uh, Justice Ali Shah, this judge who decided on the Ligari case. He came once to London and, and Robert uh, hosted an event at the Supreme Court. Um, and I asked him how he felt about uh, when people called him an activist judge. And, and he was, he said he, he really didn't like that. He disagreed completely because for him on the first place, he was deciding he's a judge, he's a human being, and he, he's decide, deciding based on the law and the constitution and uh, on what and on the science. So he had all of that behind him. And then he said something really interesting. He said, you know, a judge that decides on a case on corporate law is not called activist corporate judge. You know, why do I who decide based on environmental law am I, am I accused of, of being an activist? So I think that that's quite <laughs> enlightening and uh, has also a good sense of humor. Yes, good. Well, thank you for that. I think Ivana, you've had a fairly complete answer to your question. Do you have another quick question or are we coming to the end? Yes, we have another question. And uh, is uh, 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 any reflection on domestic courts touching on the individual state share in limiting emissions, proportion to the joint obligation under the UN, UNFCCC or Paris Agreement, uh, like the approach taken by the Netherlands courts in our agenda. So it's something uh, similar to what we were uh, discussing. Thank you so much is really on the 
individual state share in emitting emission. Sorry, what the question is what? I didn't quite understand that. Uh, it's, I think it's about the individual state share uh, yes. in emitting emission. This is uh, 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 what was decided also, what, what was discussed also in the, in the Urgenda case. Yes. So, well, I think the, I mean, uh, the agenda case, of course, that's, uh, I mean, goes back pre-Paris Agreement. Uh, but yeah. I mean, again, but the court did sort of pick up on what the, sort of the uh, Dutch government sort of commitments under Kyoto and held them to that. Um, I think more recently, um, Joanna mentioned the, friend, uh, the French case where there the sort of French government were picking up on the climate change, the Paris Agreement commitments of the government. Um, I, I think that increasingly we will find the, 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 the sort of Paris commitments, the NDCs being treated as a sort of base on which to, to develop, but it works differently in different countries. Yeah. Um, so I think there's quite a lot of room. I don't know, does anyone want to say anything more on that subject? Jason that uh, raises hand. Yes, Jason. You'll have I'll, to unmute I'll, yourself. I'll unmute myself, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I think one of the areas where we could see domestic court and activists take a stronger stance in connection to limiting emissions on a national scale is looking at the EU emissions trading scheme. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, that's a, a working uh, economic solution to taxing carbon that end users uh, have to pay for, as well as, you know, everyone who's involved in the economic food chain. And right now, the emissions trading scheme is not changing behavior because we haven't had the price of a ton of greenhouse gas emissions, the price of carbon, um, you know, it, exceed, I think the, the behavioral change point is about 80 euros a ton. And so I would think that that would be something that domestic courts could be used by activists. I think that's an area of um, activist litigation that's not been pursued yet. Um, and so those countries that are subject to the emissions trading scheme, which was the EU's attempt to comply with the Kyoto Protocol obligations, but it's continued, uh, you know, the supply of credits is too high. There's too many in the system. And uh, so I think that's a way that we could see some economic leveraging uh, to put some teeth into real sort of uh, individual state share and limiting emissions. Right. Uh, Alex wants to add something. Just a quick point, Amelia, that I think this question really exposes the limitations of litigation because politically the argument on fair share is that the global north should be looking not at reductions of 100%, but reductions of 200%, given that they have contributed so much more to the uh, to the global um, situation, uh, you know, the global quantum of carbon. And um, but but the, the North is never going to accept or uh, implement legislation or targets that can be litigated to hold it to account on that sort of uh, fair share type question. So I think this really kind of brings up an underlying theme here that litigation is always limited to what what law can be used not to, and, and, and can't hope to uh, bring in a, a genuine sense of equity. Thank you. Uh, Joanna, just a little quick remark. We've not got much time yes. now. No, no, very, uh, just a quick, very quick re remark uh, following Alex's point. I think what was really important about the Urgenda case was how they dealt with the drop in the ocean argument that was being brought by the government and, 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 and really developed the notion of a fair share of global responsibility. So uh, it, as per the, the Supreme Court decision in the agenda case, a, a country, and then, you know, of course, there is an issue of North and South, but, you know, it was the idea that a country cannot duck its responsibility to take measures by arguing that compared to the rest of the world, their own emissions are uh, insignificant or, uh, or very little. So that, for me, that's the main importance of the fair share discussion is, you know, okay, it might be just a tiny bit, but still you have to respond and you cannot hide away. Um, so this is how they, they got the the Dutch state to reduce emissions from uh, its territory in proportion to its share of responsibility. Thank you. Um, well, Ivana, I think probably have to wrap it up there, don't we? <clears throat> um, I think, yeah. I mean, I might just mention on that last point, of course, the uh, Alex mentioned that there's this Portuguese um, case which is going to the 
um, European Court of Human Rights and against 32 countries. And that will be a very good opportunity for the European Court of Human Rights to say what extent the convention can be used on in climate change context and with what results, but we have to await that. Um, so anyway, it only is, is to me to sort of thank our speakers, um, Deepa, who started us off with a fascinating discussion of the insurance implications of all this, Joanna, who looked rather more broadly at the, the world and the global south, and Alex, who gave us a very useful and overview of the UK situation, and then Jason, who came in towards the end with some very pertinent remarks, which you know, you know, we'd like to hear more from him in due course. But anyway, I, I find it a fascinating subject. It's one which we can go on I'm discussing, I'm afraid, and will do. And I think particularly in this year of COP26, it's very important that the UK should be in the lead. But thank you very much, Ivano, to you and the BIICL team and the number of people I know behind the scenes who've been keeping us on the road. So thank you all very much and well done. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lord Carwat. I'm, I'm cautious of time. I know it's already 31. So I will just take one second to once again thank all the speakers, Alex, Joanna, Jason, Deepa, and of course our chair, Lord Carwat, for making this last event of the webinar series another interesting, extremely interesting moment, and also an important occasion to discuss this timely topic, also addressing our audience question. With that said, many thanks also to Bicos event team and our research fellow, Dr. Konstantinos Yalurides, for organizing the webinar series. Thank you very much to Landmark Chambers again for their support to the series. Thank you very much to our speakers and chair, and of course to all participants for their active engagement throughout the different episodes of the series. And I hope we will be in touch soon. A report providing a synthesis of discussion on the webinar series will be also released shortly, and you will find it on the Beacle website. So thanks again, everyone, and have a good evening and goodbye.